Well, just before I bring the message to you today, I do need to uh, bring you some difficult and sad church family news. Pastor Sterling is delivering this at the uh, Kesslinger campus and at Mill Creek. Many of you have already heard, but John Harper, our director of facilities, and his wife Karen were up in Minnesota visiting some friends this past week, or family this past week, and on Friday, uh, John suffered a massive stroke, um, and for the last, he was taken to St. Mary's Hospital at Mayo Clinic, and for the last 36 hours, he's been under intensive care, and as of early this morning, uh, the doctors have determined that the damage is massive and irreversible, and that there's nothing else they can do uh, for John. Uh, Karen has simply asked that we pray for her and her two sons, Andrew and Marcus. You need to know that Pastor Jeff is with them in Minneapolis. He drove up yesterday morning since Sterling and I are doing the preaching this weekend. Uh, we are having a time of prayer for our staff and anyone else who wants to join us at noon today in the chapel right here at this campus. So if you would, would like to be with us during that time, you're welcome. Uh, don't feel pressured to, but uh, this is a devastating thing um, for our church family uh, and for their family. And so we just ask you to pray for John and his family, and we're going to bow right now and do that. So would you bow with me? Lord God, it, there are times that we scarcely know how to pray. This is one of those times. We know that you are good and you are sovereign. We know that you love John, and John has long since put his life into your hands through faith. And so today we simply put him into your hands. Help us to trust that you will do what is best, not from our perspective, but from your perspective. We ask you to surround Karen and the boys. With your spirit and your grace and your comfort, Enable Pastor Jeff to serve them and minister to them in a powerful way. We ask you to be with us here today as well. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. There are times when it's difficult to do what we're about to do for the next few minutes, and that is open God's word. But I've learned over the years that at the times when it's most difficult, it's most important for us to do. John gave most of the last decade of his life to serve this church. And I think he would want us to be the church today. So we'll help each other out for the next 25 minutes or so. When I was in the middle of the fourth grade, our family moved from Akron, Ohio, to a small town about 40 miles north of New York City called Armonk. It was in January, right in the middle of fourth grade. And so it was a nervous time going to a new school, new place, new teacher, new friends. And from what I remember of it a long time ago, uh, the teacher liked me. I felt comfortable with her. The kids seemed to accept me. Fourth grade was good, the last part of it. And then came a summer, and then came fifth grade. Fifth grade was a different school, new teacher, new classmates, and it was different. I learned very quickly there were two boys in that class who for some reason decided they didn't like me. I don't really remember why. Looking back, maybe, it was, maybe, maybe they resented my, my prolific kickball skills. I don't exactly remember. But they didn't like me. And a couple weeks into, into that year, we were out on recess. Remember recess? We should all have recess every day. We're out in a recess, and they cornered me by the monkey bars on the playground. And I didn't really know what was up, but they cornered me. One guy kind of got around behind me, another one in front of me, and I realized they wanted to fight. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait a second. Can we just use our words here? What, what? I didn't. And one grabbed me. Before I knew it, he grabbed me from behind and pinned my arms down. The other guy reared back to take a swing. This is the fifth grade. He's going to hit me right in. And I got lucky. I ducked just in time. And he hit his buddy right in the face. 
knocked him flat down, and then I got lucky again. I reached out and I grabbed the kid who tried to punch me by his punching arm by the sleeve. I got a hold of his sleeve, and I started to swing him around like that as hard as I could, and finally I let go, and he just spun into the dirt. So there it was. My first playground, first and only playground fight ended with me standing up and my two assailants lying in the dirt wondering what happened. That was completely by accident. I had accidentally won the fight without punching anybody, but I was like, you guys want some more of that? (laughs) Actually, it's not true. I probably ran and found the two biggest friends I could and hid out on the other side of the playground. But we're in a series now called Street Level Faith from the New Testament letter written by James, and he's writing to encourage relatively new believers during a time of of difficulty, persecution, confusion, and he's confronting what he sees as a dangerous disconnect between between what they believe about the gospel and how they are behaving. And today we open chapter 4, we're going to see James turns his attention to relationships, in particular to conflict. James chapter 4 today I'm going to read and comment a bit, and then we're going to open up and see what we can learn from God's Word. James writes, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Now remember, uh, James has just warned in chapter 3, we talked about this last Sunday, he's warned about relying on what he calls earthly wisdom, what we call the wisdom from below, the way the world thinks, rather than godly wisdom, wisdom from above. Because earthly wisdom produces things like bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. And so here he continues on that theme by addressing the issue of conflict between people. So what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. Now hold on a second, murder? What's he talking about here? Now, scholars think there are two ways to understand the word he uses here. One is literally people were killing someone to get what they wanted. Their conflicts were so bad that resulted in death. Other people say he's using the word kind of like Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount when he equates harboring bitterness in your heart toward a person with actually murdering them. He says, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Notice that, we'll come back to it. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against another, brothers. The one who speaks against the brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, are you, not a, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge. He was able to serve, save, and destroy. So who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, there's a ton of stuff in there, but I'm going to simplify it down to three things today. The first thing James addresses is conflict with others. Conflict with others. When I was a kid... Uh, a pair of basketball sneakers, top of the line, red high top Converse All-Stars, cost about 12 bucks. I had a pair just like that when I was in high school, wore them to school, wore them to play ball in. I wish I still had them today. But if you pay any attention to basketball shoes, the days of the $12 sneaker are long gone. Just a decent pair of basketball shoes today easily runs $100, even $150. And I know because I've had two sons play college basketball, and we have bins of sneakers at our house. For example, these are called the Adidas Futurecraft 4D sneakers. I have no idea what a 4D sneaker is. A 3D sneaker I can understand. This is a 4D sneaker, $300. Resale value on the street, upwards of $1,000. Here are what's called the Air Jordan 3 sole sneakers, $200. In fact, the NBA star named Jimmy Butler played a game this past year and a pair of sneakers valued, get this, at $20,000. These shoes right here. 
For $20,000, you should be able to fly if you wear those sneakers, right? Naturally, young people, kids see these shoes and they want them, right? In fact, they want them so badly, it turns out, they're willing to steal and kill to get them. I read a report this past week that estimated over a thousand young people every year in the cities of America are mugged, beaten, or killed for their sneakers alone. But that's nothing new, James says. He says here in James 4, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot, cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. James is saying that co- conflict with others begins with a conflict within ourselves. He says your passions are at war within you. The word passion here is the Greek word hedone, from which we get our word hedonism, meaning pleasure, lust, strong desire, with an emphasis on physical pleasure and material wealth. He says you desire and cannot have. You covet and cannot obtain. So you murder, fight, and quarrel. Now remember their situation. We know from James chapter 1 that um, this is only about 10, 15 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. A time of persecution has risen, and so these are believers who have had to flee from the area of Jerusalem. They're scattered about now because of the persecution. We can assume many are facing financial hardship, and these trials have caused some of them to doubt the goodness and grace of God, caused some to be guilty of what he calls partiality. Remember that? They were paying too much attention, giving preferential treatment to those who had money, who had wealth. It caused some to speak with poisonous and destructive words, caused some to abandon wisdom that comes from God and to rely on wisdom that comes from below. And they descended into bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. And here he says, into coveting, that which is not theirs. Now, human beings have always wanted what they cannot have. Started way back in the very first book of the Bible in Genesis with Adam and Eve. God said you could have any tree in the garden for food, any tree, except do not eat from that tree, because if you eat of that one, you will surely die. So how did the serpent tempt them? Oh, no, 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 you really want that one. God's holding back from you. You want the one he said you can't have. Cain wanted the the favor that God gave his brother Abel after his sacrifice. So what did Cain do? He killed his brother. Jacob wanted the birthright and the blessing that belonged to his older brother Esau. So what did he do? He tricked Esau out of his birthright and lied to his father to get his blessing. Human beings have always wanted what they cannot have. And it continues today at the personal level. Not just kids with $200 sneakers, but you see someone driving a nice car. And something inside you wants that. We covet. We see someone who lives in a bigger, nicer house, and we want, we covet. I see that guy down the street with the perfect yard, perfect grass, and I want his grass. (laughs) Here's a challenge. I thought about that this week. Simple thing. You know, we live in a culture, our culture teaches us to covet, I think. It teaches us to think that way. So here's a challenge. This this is for me, and I'll share it with you in case you want to jump in. Try to go a single day this week, just one day, without that coveting thing happening in your heart. Pay attention every time, just one day. And live in a contented way. It continues at the societal level. We see this all the time. Political parties fight over power and position. Nations fight over oil and gold. Here James says, you do not have because you do not ask. He switches gears here. Now he's talking about prayer. You do not have because you do not ask. I think he's thinking about what Jesus taught us about prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, your Father in heaven knows what you need before you even ask him. And then in what we call the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day, what? A bigger house. More money, please. No. Give us this day our daily bread. Trust God for daily 
provision. James says you don't pray because you don't trust the grace and goodness of God. And when you do pray, your prayers are corrupt, motivated by selfish desires. Because you don't really want God, you don't really want his grace, his goodness, his holiness. You always want him to give you stuff. You want him to give you more money. And the result is discontentment, covetousness, bitterness toward others, and conflict. So he says your conflicts with others are revealing a deeper conflict with God himself. So the first point is conflict with others. He moves on to talk about conflict with God. Some time ago, uh, I had a conversation with a man who had asked to talk, and he was going through a very difficult uh, and messy divorce process. But in the course of telling me his story so I would understand where he was, he said that some 15 to 20 years earlier, he was a single man and, and, and a follower of Jesus in his mind, um, but he had a series of disappointments in relationships, breakups, that were very painful. And after the second or third broken relationship, he remembered deciding that all of that pain was God's fault. And that if God was not going to do his part in this whole faith interaction and give him what he most wanted, then he was done with it. He remembers deciding, I'm done with Jesus, I'm done with prayer, I'm done with the church, I'm done with the whole thing. And he decided to live for himself and to do whatever made him feel good. That decision eventually led into a relationship with a woman who was not a believer, 15-year marriage that descended into conflict, rage, addiction, and pain, the one he was trying to get out of at the moment we were talking. And he told me that he learned the hard way, the truth of what James is saying here, that conflicts with others are rooted in a deeper conflict with God himself. James 4, verse 4, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? You adulterous people. Interesting choice of words. Why does he use the word adultery here? Now, adultery, we all know, is unfaithfulness in a covenant relationship. It's a betrayal of the heart a giving of affection and love to another. But James isn't talking about a marriage between a man and a woman here. He's talking about spiritual adultery. Now what's that? Spiritual adultery is giving our devotion, our affection, our worship to anything other than God. And I think this happens all the time, especially in our culture that lifts up material wealth that lifts up entertainment and celebrity as if it were a god, an idol to bow before. Sometimes faith in Jesus is really faith in what we hope Jesus will give us or can bring us. Sometimes our, the sum total of our faith is that Jesus, the God somehow will protect us from all pain, that he will give us the things that we most think we need. This is not faith that surrenders to Jesus and the fullness of the gospel. This is not faith that understands that we, are received, we have received a new heart through the forgiveness of sin, a new identity by being adopted as his children, new purpose to live for his kingdom, and new destiny to dwell with him and reign with him forever. This is faith that sees Jesus as some sort of a, a personal rabbit's foot, kind of a genie in a bottle, what I call magical faith. And when a person with this kind of superficial or immature faith doesn't get what they think they want or what they think they deserve or experiences disappointment or pain, sometimes they turn their affections elsewhere. The biblical word for this is idolatry. James calls it adultery. This is Moses coming down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments of God, the law of God, only to find them worshiping a golden calf. This is the rich young ruler in the New Testament responding to Jesus' offer of eternal life by turning his back and going toward his wealth because he loved his money. And evidently, some of this is happening in that early Christian community. 
And James is concerned. He calls it friendship with the world. But it's really a rejection. It's a rejection of the friendship of God himself. And it results in what he calls jealousy. He's, he writes, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? What does he mean that God is jealous? Now, there are two kinds of jealousy. One is coveting that which is not yours, to be jealous for something that someone else has, and the other is to be jealous over that which is rightfully yours. Now, God is not jealous in the sense of coveting. But God is jealous for us because we rightfully belong to him. The Bible teaches that God has loved us, each one of us, to the point of sacrificial death, that he purchased our freedom, our forgiveness, through the blood of Jesus, and that he's given us his own spirit to dwell in us forever. And when we reject his love... When we turn and give our hearts to another, the eternal God experiences the pain of jealousy. He longs for that relationship to be restored. And so he pursues in order to restore that relationship. So James says, you have conflict with others because your passions are warring within you. You have conflict with God because you've turned your affections to another. And then the third part of this message is an encounter with grace. James moves directly to an encounter with grace. Pick it up in verse 6. But he gives more grace. But he gives more grace. Now, if you're paying attention to this passage, you should be saying, where does this come from, grace? He's just been talking about bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, fighting, quarreling, and murder, and adultery with other gods. Grace comes like a thunderbolt. We'll come back to it in a minute. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. So James is concerned. He's confronting some pretty awful stuff that's happening in the, in the Christian community. And then seemingly out of nowhere, he writes, but he gives more grace. We've got to talk about grace for a moment. What is grace? The biblical concept of grace is favor, joy, God's delight, and God's blessing. And there are three truths about grace in this text and throughout the New Testament we need to know. First, grace is not earned or deserved by definition. Grace cannot be earned or deserved. Now, there will always be some for whom this is a problem. There are always going to be some who insist on getting what they deserve. I only want my rights. I only want what I've earned. And it bugs them. It re they resent the idea that a drug dealer or a or death row inmate can receive the same grace they can when they've been a better person. Listen, here's the truth. None of us should want what we deserve. Do not want what you deserve. The Bible says what we deserve by our sin is death, separation from God. We don't want what we deserve. We want grace, which is exactly what we don't deserve. Secondly, notice grace comes first. Let me back up a bit. In Romans 5, Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. God demonstrates, verse 8, his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. That means grace comes first. We don't have to clean up ourselves. We don't have to clean up our act before we receive God's offer of grace. Rather, grace is what produces the transformation that comes afterward. And thirdly, grace is greater. Grace is greater than our sin. Notice, James says, but he gives not enough grace, but more grace. He gives more grace. Paul in Romans chapter 5 says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, 
But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. What that tells me is that if my sin fills a cup, his grace is a gallon. If my sin is a gallon worth, his grace is a swimming pool. If my sin is a swimming pool, his grace is an ocean. There is more grace. So if grace is free, if grace is independent of our goodness, if it cannot be earned or deserved, if it's greater, how do we experience it? How do we receive it? Well, James says, submit. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. He gives grace to the humble. The only thing grace requires is the humility to receive it as a gift. The only thing grace requires is surrender. That is, surrender your heart, surrender your sin, surrender your life, the one who is greater than you, to a grace that is greater than your sin. And now I think everything that comes after this point in James' letter is about the result of grace in our lives. James says, then resist. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What does it mean to resist? Now, resist in the Greek was a a kind of an aggressive word, a more aggressive word than we hear in the word resist. It means to fight. It means to actively fight back, to do battle with temptation. Yes, we have an enemy who desires our destruction. Yes, we have selfish desires. That's where we're tempted. I often say, you know yourself. If you were Satan, how would you tempt you? Well, that's how he's going to. But James is saying, we also have grace. We have a resource on our side. Grace tells us we are loved, we are forgiven, we've been adopted, we are new creatures, and by grace we can resist. We don't have to give in. We can resist. How do we resist? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. When you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Well, how? We resist through prayer. Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We resist by the power of the Holy Spirit, who he has promised us as his followers, the Spirit who convicts of sin and righteousness, who guides, who strengthens. We resist by being surrounded by this community of faith that we call the church. We resist together. Next he says, by grace we draw near. We can draw near to God. And he draws near to us. How do we draw near? Again, through prayer. Through the prayer of confession especially. We are already forgiven. But through the prayer of confession we draw near and experience nearness with God. Prayer is going where Jesus already is. We draw near through God's word. What we're doing right now. We, read, we don't read God's word like we read a novel or a history book or trigonometry. We read it to understand the one who offers us more grace for that relationship. We draw near by sharing in a worshiping community. community. When we gather here to worship, we are drawing near to God together. And then after that, James goes to a very interesting place. And I had to think and pray about this. It confused me. Frustrated me, he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. What? So heavy, so negative. What does he mean? I think what he means is when we have experienced grace, when that grace bursts upon our souls and we realize we are loved and forgiven when we do not deserve to be loved and forgiven, suddenly we see ourselves and our sin as it is. And two things happen. First, we repent. That means we turn around, we leave the false gods and the sin we've been following. We leave and we turn back to the one who loves us. We repent. And secondly, we mourn. Now, why mourn? Because we realize all the time and all the energy spent wasted chasing after other gods. And we mourn. And that's the grieving, but it's the result of grace in our lives. And then finally, he ends with this, verse 11. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, 
you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, and he, he who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? Again here, I think James is talking about the result of grace in our lives. So those who have experienced and received more grace, a grace greater than their sin, a change of heart, a change of identity, a change of purpose, are not to judge any longer their neighbor, are not to speak evil against their brother, but rather to love. We are not among those who withdraw grace, we are those who offer grace, he says, which is the natural outcome of receiving God's grace. There's a beautiful story, one of the more well-known stories in all the Gospels in John chapter 8, usually referred to as the woman caught in adultery. The way the story goes, and most of you can remember it, um, some religious men, some of them among the Pharisees, the most religious of the religious, uh, claim to have caught a woman in the very act of adultery. Now one has to think, how do you go about doing that? Well, they did, and they drag her, most likely mostly naked, before Jesus in a public place before a man who's regarded as a rabbi, a holy man. Now I want you to think about Try to think of an image of a person that you've seen in the media, a person from history, maybe a person you've known, who is the most shame-covered, stained, sin-wrecked person you can think of. And when you get that image, multiply it by 100. In that culture at that time, there's nothing more shameful than this situation happening, and they've dra- these men have dragged a woman they claim is guilty of that and later in the street, right in front of a holy man, and they say to Jesus, the law says we are to stone a woman like this. What do you say? It's a powerful moment. It's a disturbing moment. And, and in that awful moment, Jesus says two things. First, he speaks to the crowd of self-righteous and religious men, each of whom is holding a stone. And he says, and we all know what he says, Let the one among you who is without sin cast the first stone. What he's really saying is you and I both know you're all a bunch of phonies. You and I both know you're all a bunch of hypocrites. You and I both know there's not one of you who is righteous. We all know. And then the Bible says one by one, oldest to youngest, they drop the stones and they leave. And then Jesus says the second thing. He speaks to the woman. He says... Would you look at yourself? Look at the mess you've made of your life. Yeah, I'll help you, but first you need to clean yourself up a bit. You need to go to church, you know, get in a class, get a job. No. He says, where are your accusers? Does no one condemn you? Neither do I. Now go and leave your life of sin. Do you hear it? You see it? Grace is not earned or deserved. Grace comes first. The woman hasn't said a word yet. She's done nothing to deserve this, nothing to indicate she's going to change anything. Grace comes first, and the grace is greater, is greater than her sin. Now, we don't know what happens to that woman. There's not another word in all of the New Testament spoken about her. Spontaneously last night, Saturday night, I said, I'd like to write a movie script about this woman's life. What do you think became of her? I was thinking about that this week. I wonder, after she experienced that, the grace of Jesus, do you think she drew closer to God or further away? Do you think she became more judgmental in her life or less judgmental? Two questions I want to leave you with. Where do you need more grace today? Where do you need more grace? Are you carrying around something, the weight of something, some, some, something some, the weight of guilt or the weight of shame or the weight of regret, something that somehow you believe is beyond the reach of his grace? No, there's more grace. His grace is greater. Secondly, who in your life, in the sphere you you walk in, your family, your friends, your neighborhood, who needs more grace from you this week? Maybe someone who's far from God. 
They need grace. Maybe someone you've been in a conflict with. Talked to a woman last night after service. She's been wronged, hurt, in a conflict. But was felt convicted. She needs to find a way to offer grace, even though she's the one in the wrong, that's been wronged. Who needs more grace from you? He gives more grace, James says. And that changes everything. Your bow as I close today. Lord, we thank you for your word today. For this ancient letter, so direct, so full of wisdom. And we confess, I confess that at times we've turned our hearts from you to the world around us that promises so much but does not deliver. We've wanted so many things. And so today, remind us of your grace. Grace that loves, grace that forgives, grace that purifies. Allow us to extend that same grace to others. We pray these things in your name. Amen.